Attention, Four, please. Four, three, three, two, one, one. We have ignition. You already know who it is. The following presentation is controversial and may be offensive to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Radio from the heart of America now. And now, the Commander-in-Chief is back. Heart of America, with Carl Gallops. The Oval Office of Gulf Coast Talk Radio. All right, I want to welcome you to this edition of Heart of America with Carl Gallops, your host, Brandon Gallops, Big B, your co-host. Brandon Big B, it's good to have you with us today on Heart of America. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. And listen, today's special edition is really focused in on the the phenomena that's coming upon us rather quickly as we are doing this show today, uh, this phenomena that's sweeping the Internet. It's in and out of churches and in and out of Bible conferences and prophecy conferences. Uh, people are keyed in on this September 23rd, 2017 date as a possible rapture date or, or alternatively, uh, a, a possible date of uh, prescient ominous uh, ominousness. In other words, uh, in other words, the, people are saying they they think that something big is going to happen because this particular date. Uh, there's a secret formula in the Bible that uh, arrives at September the twenty third, and we'll get to that secret formula and the exact passage later. But the bottom line is, Brandon, it seems to me. That well, I know for a fact that that what the people who are really caught up in this movement are saying is that there's going to be a, a particular signs in the heavens, if you will, coming from the alignment of constellations, stars, the sun and the moon that predict certain dates in the future. And some, of course, are even saying that it it is the date of the rapture of the church. So what I want to ask you, Brandon, because I know you've done a lot of teaching and preaching and interviews on this particular topic, just give our audience, if you will, a, a, a basic sweeping biblical overview of this whole topic and understanding of the signs in the heavens. And I've heard you do this before, and it's brilliant. Go, go all the way back to Genesis, where we first hear that phrase, and explain to our audience, first of all, just the biblical foundation of this whole topic. No, absolutely. Uh, Genesis one fourteen says, uh, And God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs, so the sun and the moon and the stars, they are signs. But then God goes on to tell us to mark sacred times and days and years. So the sacred times there, if we go back to the original Hebrew language, uh, you know, it very clearly points us to the feast of the Lord, to the festivals. And, and so what are the sun and the, and the moon and the stars, the light there to point us to? Well, they're, they're very clearly, as spelled out in God's words, to to mark the festivals, the feast of the Lord, and then of course days and years. Well, that's very simple. It's a calendar. So if we just start in the beginning in God's word, what did God put the sun and the moon and the stars in place for? Well, to serve as light, number one, and then secondly, to mark His feast, His festivals, as laid out in Leviticus twenty-three, and to give us a way to keep time, our calendars. And so, you know, listen, uh, we have to be very honest if we're, if we're going to examine this uh, thoroughly, that there are other places in the Scripture where, listen, even Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 24, I believe in uh, verse 29, uh, talks about uh, signs in the heavens at, at the very last days, you know, right before his return. But he describes an event that has never before happened. The sun will cease to shine. The moon will cease to shine. The stars will fall from the sky. Well, those things have never all happened at once. Yes. We've seen solar eclipses. We've seen lunar eclipses. uh, We've seen meteor showers. But we've never seen the sun not shine, the moon not shine, and stars just start falling from the sky all at once. Yeah. That would be a first, a huge event. In, in the heavens, if you will. Yeah, and, and you've, you've made a very important biblical point, and that is, in those passages where it speaks of the signs in the heavenlies, they all, you, you know, that, that speak of prophetic events, they always accompany basically the day of the Lord or the return of Christ. And, and, and it's, um, 
and as you said, there are never before unprecedented events, and they are happening simultaneously with uh, the return of the Lord or the rapture of the church or something like that. It's it's not that we're we're never told in the scriptures, as far as I can see, that we are to use the alignment of constellations and stars and the moon and the sun and the planets to predict future events. There's a word for that, and God tells us not to do that, right, Brandon? <laughs> That's right. That's astrology. Yeah, and so and, and we're warned against astrology uh, in many different places, Old and New Testament. So we do have to be very careful. And listen, um, you know, some people have even tried to point to different uh, biblical events uh, to proclaim that there were certain alignment of constellations or or events in the heavens, such as eclipses, solar eclipses that happened during those times. Uh, one is, you know, when Jesus was on the cross. Uh, the scriptures tell us very clearly that from noon until the uh, until the third hour, that that the the sky was darkened, it, it, the sun did not shine for three solid hours. Uh, now, listen, that's a that is a one time event that that we have in, as recorded in human history. We can only point to one time where the sun has not shined for a period of three solid hours in the middle of the day. You say, well, what about eclipses? Listen, you can very easily uh, look up and document the longest recorded eclipse in human history, going back to 4,000 B.C., lasted a total of seven minutes. So Jesus on the cross, the sky turns black for three solid hours in the middle of the day. That's not an eclipse. That is the hand of God reaching out and blocking the sun from shining. Maybe God simply spoke and told the sun not to shine, like he spoke the sun into existence. Yeah. You know, we don't know, but what we do know is it was not just an eclipse. It was it was something far greater uh, and far far more wonderful than just a a a, a uh, uh, you know eclipses happen and they can be rare in the way that they happen and the places that they happen, but they've been happening since the beginning of time. Yeah. And they can also be predicted uh, with great precision now, so we know that these are natural, cyclical events. Now, that's not to say that, you know, eclipses don't invoke a sense of awe in people or even a sense of spirituality or a sense of introspection and our relationship with the Lord. And by the way, when that happens during an eclipse— or some other astronomical event, a, a, a meteor shower, or maybe even a strike on the Earth of some meteorite or something that's recorded in the news, you know? When those kinds of things happen, and people say, oh my gosh, I wonder if that's a sign from heaven. Well, the bottom line is, God can certainly speak to individual hearts with those naturally occurring events, and he could even put his hand in the, in the middle of it and cause something unnatural and supernatural to happen. But the bottom line is, the Bible gives the answer to that question, Brandon, and that is, the heavens were put in their places to declare the glory of God. The heavens, right. yeah, the stars, the moon, the sun, the planets, the whole intricacy, the mathematical precision with which it all works— uh, it is, is is was placed there for uh, to cause us to have a sense of awe and wonder. In fact, the the Psalms you know speak of that. That day after day, night after night, the speech of the stars is poured forth throughout the nations, and the language is universal. In other words, I don't care what language you speak. I don't care what color you are. I don't care if you're a billionaire or you live in a mud hut in Africa. When you look up into the sky at night. On a on 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 a dark you know night where you can just see the heavens in all their vast array, uh, that is God's language. It doesn't need doesn't need interpretation. We we can look up into the sky and we can say, Oh my gosh, I'm so teeny, and God is so big, and this universe and His creation is so big and and magnificent and awesome. So so yeah, that those signs are in the heavenlies for us to bring us to a point of awe and worship, but they're not there for us to look for certain alignments so that we can predict a future event. Again, we're getting back to astrology. Am, am I? Do you agree with me there or not, Brandon? No, 
Well, I agree 100%. I mean, not only are nowhere in God's Word do we see where we are directed to use the sun and the moon and the stars as as, as predictors or as, as future tellers or fortune tellers or anything like that. Um, but, you know, listen, let's just say that we could. It, 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 so many of the times we're setting these dates based on our calendar that we currently live by, which is not God's calendar. So we're mixing up, you know, all these different theories and logics and and and, and different ways of telling time and, and and keeping of days and months and years. And so I think that we're bringing about more confusion than we are truth. And then here's the sad reality: who is the author of confusion? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, so, not, it's not God. It's not the creator of the universe. That's right. As a matter of fact, he brings about the very opposite of confusion. Yeah. You know, he brings about a, 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 a spirit of power and of love and of what? A sound mind or sober mind. Yeah, and of course we're talking about the one who brings about confusion. Jesus calls him what? The prince of the power of the air. air. (laughs) So yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to have to be careful. He's the great deceiver, and if he can take our eyes off of Jesus and off the clear contextual word of God and put our eyes on the alignment of constellations and stars, where God's word does not say to us directly. When you see this alignment of constellations, stars, the sun and the moon, then you shall know that I shall return for my church on that day. I mean, you know, if the scripture said that, that would be a different thing altogether. That would be a clear prophecy wherein God is saying, I am specifically using this alignment as my sign. It's an unprecedented alignment. It's a supernatural, one-time occurring thing. And when you see it happen, then you'll know the rapture of the church is at hand. But see, nothing like that is in the scriptures. And so if Satan can take our eyes off the clear word of God, and off of our faith in Jesus Christ, and put it on looking for secret formulas in secret scriptures for a secret rapture, and then confusing the church, and when that day comes and goes, and nothing happens like a rapture, then people will fall away from the faith. And Satan delights in that, Brandon. No, no, he does. And look, you, you brought to light several, several great points, uh, because, you know, listen, you said if we can, if if these events take our our eyes off of the clear, contextual, focused word of God, what happens so often when these dates are set? People buy into them. P- portions of the church buy into them, and and you'll see people that'll be selling everything that they own and running up to the top of the mountain for you know waiting because this is the rapture of the church instead of being what we're called to be, the salt and the light, and being out and spreading the gospel. We're expecting this is the end, so in a sense, people are giving up yeah. on what we should be doing. So, so you, you know, you're right. We just have to be very, very careful about this. Um, and then the great falling away. Listen, I've said that for such a long time that, you know, people, when they buy into these things, and because, listen, there can be very convincing arguments that are made by using Scripture, by doing just what Satan did, taking Scripture and twisting it out of context. And, and and then say, yeah, well, look at this constellation, and look, it lines up, and it matches this date, and, and on and on. So there can be very convincing arguments that are made, but then when it doesn't happen, have we done more harm or, or good? Yeah. It, because, because if people have put all of their faith into this date, then everything else they put along with that, they will throw away. And, and then that goes back to what Jesus says, false prophets. And, and it, you know, so, I mean, it's just, it's just a building process, and we're seeing, I think we're living, at least in the beginning of the great falling away. Yeah, and let me give you and the audience a perfect example of what you just said. When I came to the Gulf Coast in 1987, as we're doing this show today live, it, that was almost 31 years ago. In 1987, March of 1987, I came to the Gulf Coast to pastor this church uh, right outside of Pensacola, and I've been in that one church ever since. And in 1987, there was a teaching going around based upon a book. The title of it was 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Going to Return in 1988. 
And it was huge all over the United States, really huge in this area along the Gulf Coast because several churches were pushing it and promoting it and even had the author of the book come speak as though it was gospel truth. Uh, even people in the church I was pastoring, they're continually asking me, what about it? What about it? What about it? And I began to preach, and I tried to, to do it balanced and graciously. You know, you don't want to make fun of people that you you know, you know you're you know they're wrong, Brandon. But you know, I want to be gracious and not try to be uh, you know ugly about it. But I was just preaching my heart out and just warning people, please, if this guy is setting a date for the rapture, you can pretty much take it to the bank. It's not going to happen on that day. And what he had done, he had taken calendars and feast days. I mean, he had a convincing argument. But I was convinced in my soul that. Of course the Lord's not going to return on that date because this guy's, you know, selling a book, he's selling a ministry, he's making money hand over fist, he's going all around the place, he's the big hero of the church, and you're right, Brandon, 1988 came and went, nothing happened, and there was a great falling away, and newspapers and Christian media reported on it. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people left the church because of it. Yeah, so that's where we have to be careful. Listen, if we just stick to the Word and just preach the Word and, and what it says in context and what it clearly says and clearly means and how it clearly applies to the times we're living in, then, you know, look, people can get mad at us, they can talk bad about us, but they can't call us a false prophet. That's they right. They can't call us a liar, you know? I mean, we, it's, right. just, it, it, it's God's Word, it is, it's what it says, and, and here's what's going on in the world around us that, that lines up perfectly with it. Absolutely. So, and that, that's what we need to stick to as a church. Yeah, well said, Brendan. Listen, I'm hearing the music, so we're going to have to take a break. But when we come back, Brendan, let's you and I talk about Revelation chapter 12 and the vision that John gives, because that's the, the passage of Scripture that some people are preaching and teaching holds the secret formula. You and I believe it's an astrological formula, in other words, astrology, which the Word of God says is nothing more than witchcraft. And I'm not calling people who believe this witches. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying God says don't get involved in this. If I want you to know about a date, you'll know it. There are no secret formulas for secret raptures and secret passages of Scripture wherein there's an alignment of constellations and planets whereby you can divine a coming event. I mean, that is astrology. But let's examine, Brandon, when we come back, this particular passage, Revelation 12. Folks, of course, I hear the music, you hear the music. We've got to take a break. When we come back, more of Heart of America with Carl and Brandon Gallops. We'll be right back after this time out. Don't go anywhere. Radio from the Heart of America now. All right, folks, welcome back to Heart of America. Your host, Carl Gallops, co-host, Brandon Gallops. So today we're discussing the signs in the heavenlies, if you will. Now, Right now, as we promised in this second portion, um, we are going to discuss Revelation chapter 12, Brandon, because this is... The bulk. Uh, th this is where the bulk of this teaching uh, and and prophesying and preaching that's going on right now, and really, it's been going on for years. Uh, because somebody years ago uh, kind of discerned uh, this alignment of the constellations and stars and planets, and and came up with Revelation twelve and said, "Wow, it matches the description of Revelation twelve." So therefore, there must be something big. And then they started trying to apply the rapture of the church to it and everything else. Uh, of course, the deal is, and we don't have time to discuss this, but our good friend Joel Richardson has um, illustrated in a video that he did on his website, joelstrumpet.com, uh, he actually pulled up the star charts uh, and the NASA uh, programs to go out to that date and the dates before it and the dates around it to show that if you're going to make that fit, you have to do a lot of fudging and some of the things that these people are proclaiming happen in the planets and the stars do not actually happen like they are saying they do. So there's a little bit of nefariousness to this stuff, I think, Brandon. Have you heard some of that? Oh, no, I, I've not only heard it, but I've seen it, and, and, I, and I agree. I think you do have to stretch at the very least and, you know, outright be deceptive at the very worst uh, to, to make it fit what 
might appear to just a scanning or, or just a reading with no in-depth study of Revelation 12, uh, especially verse 1. Yeah, yeah. Well, well said, and I appreciate that. But but this is just the kind of—listen, folks, Brandon and I want you to know, we are not—we're not mentioning names. There are two or three folks that have big names in this movement. We are not mentioning names, and we're not disparaging them. We're not questioning their love for Jesus. That's between them and the Lord, and their lives will prove it out. Um, all we're trying to do, and we're not disparaging people who have kind of gotten into this stuff, kind of like the 88 reasons why Jesus is going to return in 1988. This is a movement. It's almost cult-like. Uh, but, but we're not, all we're trying to do, all that Brandon and I are trying to do is to present to you the contextual biblical truth. And listen, Brandon and I will admit that if on September 23rd, 2017, the rapture occurs, we'll be going up shouting, we were wrong, we were wrong, praise God, we were wrong. Right, right, Brandon? <laughs> That's exactly right. That, yeah. that is right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, uh, but in the meantime, I just have a feeling, Brandon, based upon the contextual exegetical examination of the word and the language and the original languages, I have a feeling we're not wrong. I have a feeling that on September 23rd, the church is not going to be raptured. And I have a feeling that nothing particularly prophetically big is going to happen on that day that aligns with uh, an uh, um, astrology chart. Um, I, I just really don't think it is. Now, sometimes pe- you know, I've heard people say, yeah, but what if something big happens on that day? And my answer has been, you know, nowadays and the prophetic days we're living in, something big happens on every day. No, you, you are right. I mean, listen, who, who, who knows? I mean, uh, as we're recording this, uh, North Korea shot a missile over Japan yesterday. Yeah. So, I mean, <laughs> that's pretty big. I know. You know, uh, <laughs> so where was the sign and the sun and the moon and the stars, you know? So, you know, you're exactly right. I mean, we're just living in interesting times where prophecy is unfolding before our very eyes, and all we have to do is read God's Word and listen to the news. To put it together, we don't have to look to the stars for interpretation. That's right. For a certain alignment of planets and constellations and stars, you're absolutely right. Okay, well, let's get to Revelation 12, but, and most of our listeners will be familiar with it, but I just want to say this. Before we go to Revelation 12, verse 1, which is the verse that's being used to come up with this secret formula, I want to put it in context, and the best way to do that is to go back just a little bit. Now, remember, when Revelation was written, John did not write it in chapters and verses. It was written as one unfolding story, one unfolding revelation that was given to him while he was in the throne room of God. Now, while he's in the throne room of God receiving the revelation, in chapter 11, verse 19, which is right before chapter 12, verse 1, here's what John says, then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Now remember, he's in actual heaven. He's in the presence of God, in the throne room, in the real temple of God, which is in the dimension of the realm of God himself. The whole book of Hebrews tells us that, that everything on earth concerning the ark of the covenant and the temple and all that is a shadow of the reality which is in the domain of God. So John's there. He says, now, God's temple in heaven, and that Greek word for heaven is oronus, was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, a great hail storm. And then chapter 12, verse 1, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven, Brandon. In other words, the context is he's saying, I am in heaven. And while in heaven at God's throne in his temple, he shows me a sign. And that word sign in the Greek can mean uh, he shows me a symbol or he gives me a revelation. So this is not a great and wondrous sign that appears in the heavenlies. And it's not a great and wondrous sign that appears in the heavens. Now, Brandon, you and I were having this discussion during the break. That word heaven, order noose, I want our audience to know, it can mean just like our English word heaven. It can mean the, the, the domain of God, the he, you know, heaven in, in his presence. It can mean the stars and the constellations, the sun and the moon, the heavens or the heavenlies. Or it can mean the air. And, and the, way, the way we use that word, I can say Wow, God is on his throne in heaven today, okay? Or I can say, wow, look at the heavens tonight. The stars are beautiful. Or I can say, wow, the birds are filling the heavens today. 
Well, we know the birds aren't up in the stars and skies, and we know the birds aren't, excuse me, the stars and the planets. We know the birds aren't in God's domain. What am I talking about? I'm talking about the air, the atmosphere. So that's how we use the word, and it can be used that way in the Bible. So you say, well, how do we know how it's used? Context. The word, the, the verse before chapter 12, verse 1, gives us the context. God's temple in heaven was opened. In the next verse, a great and wondrous sign then appeared to me in heaven. <laughs> Brendan, I don't know how much clearer it could be than that. This is not an astrology secret formula. So what's the great and wondrous sign? Well, Brandon, it goes on to say, here's the sign. A woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant, cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Brandon, that, I, I'm so excited about this. You'll have to forgive me. That ties to Genesis 37, and the early church would have known it, made up primarily of Jews, and even the Gentiles who were in the church were being preached to and taught from the Old Testament scriptures and proving that Jesus is the Christ, and, and they would have known about Genesis 37. What is that? It's the dream that Joseph had, who's the son of Jacob, who would later be called Israel, the 12 sons. Joseph had a dream from God, and Brandon, you know, you and I both know that if God gives us a vision or a dream about something he's going to do in our lives to exalt our ministries, it's really unwise to go telling a bunch of other people about it, isn't it? No, it, it, it really is. You, you <laughs> kind of keep that to yourself and 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 record and wait for confirmation. Right. Maybe and and you know, you know maybe share it with one or two like in other words if I had a dream or yeah, yeah. If, if I had a dream or a vision like that, I would share it with my wife. I would share it with you. And that would be about it. I mean, I wouldn't get up and announce it in my church. Let me tell you what God says he's going to do with me. Ha, ha, ha. You know, of course not, because people don't understand that. They take it in the wrong way. Um, some people will attack you for it. Well, that's what happens. In Genesis 37, Joseph said, I had a dream, and I saw a woman clothed with the sun, and the moon was under her feet, and 11 stars were around her head. Now, some people are listening saying, aha, it says 12 in Revelation. Yeah, but Joseph was the 12th star, and he identified right. that because he said, God showed me that the rest of you would bow down to me. Well, it was the telling of that dream that got Joseph delivered eventually into the hands of the Egyptians as a slave. But the vision came true to Joseph because years later, after going through prison, he was exalted to the second highest position. And then God appeared to him in another dream and said, look, there's a, a, a famine coming upon the land, but you're going to store up. You're going to go to Pharaoh. And, and, and so he did. And, and God used Joseph to save the people of Egypt and the surrounding areas from the famine. They stored up for seven years. And, 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 and then his brothers came to Egypt not knowing Joseph was even still alive, and they literally had to bow down in his presence, and he literally saved their lives. So the whole thing came true. And, and that, then we know that after that, after Joseph dies, and, and, and of course all of his brothers, and that Pharaoh dies, that sometime later a Pharaoh arose who knew not Joseph and his family and took those Hebrews that were in the land and turned them into slaves. And for 400 years they were slaves until Moses brought them out and until Joshua brought them into the promised land. And then what happened? They became the nation of Israel. And what did God's word say about Israel? Out of you. Unto you a child is born, unto you a son is given, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, a Prince of Peace, and, and unto him he will rule the nations. Oh, so you mean Israel will give birth to a son, a male child? <laughs> yes, well, that's what Revelation 12, 1 and 2 is all about. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me read this again. He says, while I'm in heaven... A great and wondrous sign appeared to me, a woman clothed with the sun, moon under her feet, crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain. She was about to give birth. And then we keep reading, Brandon, I'm going to move on for sake of time. Then we read that then another sign appeared, a red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns. We find out later in Revelation 12 that's none other than Satan. We find out in Revelation 13 that it's none other than the embodiment of the Antichrist who is to come. But it talks about how the dragon stands in front of the woman trying to destroy the the child that is born to the woman. Brandon, it's so clear for those of us that know the Bible. This is not... No, no. Go ahead. 
No, yeah, I was going to say, it, it is so clear. And, and listen, you know, we, we also have to be honest that Revelation 12 um, can be a very confusing uh, uh, chapter. It, it, the whole chapter can be, if you don't understand, because, it, listen, there are parts of it that take you all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Yes. And then there are parts of it that have not been fulfilled yet. Yes. So... So it, it, it and it's not written, uh, in my opinion, Revelation twelve, even in and of itself, in a chronological order, uh, because there are individual verses in there that have had fulfillments in the past, but the final fulfillments have not been made yet. Yeah. So it so it can be confusing in that right, but again, it's just it, it's telling us it's backing up. It's telling us these things have happened. This was the birth of the nation of Israel, the birth of Jesus. Uh, you know, on and on. And, you know, I mean, look. The, uh, the dragon uh, being thrown down to the earth, it, that can take you all the way back to the garden, to the fall of Satan, you know? And then there will eventually be a final fulfillment of that when Satan embodies a man on the earth and, and pours out, uh, you know, uh, all of his demonic influence on the earth in a physical form. So just all of these things, and it's this backwards and forwards language of taking us back and then taking us forward and then things that we're seeing in our present time. So it can be confusing, and like all, you know, so much of Scripture tells us, this requires insight, Yeah, you know? This requires wisdom, uh, you know, so we have to read it, we have to look what other Scriptures match up with this, and, and what is it really saying? And, and the danger of taking Revelation 12, 1 and pulling it out, like so many are doing, is there's the same danger with any verse of Scriptures. I can take one verse, and I can take it out and try to make it stand alone. And I can make it appear to be something that it's not. Exactly. And and, and and we can talk about, you can take any single scripture out of the Bible and do that, and, and we could twist and pervert it into something that it's not. Yeah, exactly. And a good example of that is if I wanted to prove that Christians can be cannibals, I'll take that yeah. passage of scripture where Jesus says, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood if you're going to follow me. So in other words, we have to cannibalize in order to be a Christian. If I take that one verse... And don't read anything before it or anything after it or compare it to any other scripture. I can make it say that. And I, I fear that something like that is happening with Revelation 12.1. Brandon, we're almost out of time. We've only got a couple minutes. I'm going to let you wrap it up because Revelation 12, as, you've just so been, as you have just so brilliantly been expanding upon, it also has some good, solid preaching and, and perspective for us in these last days concerning what Satan's really up to and how we stand against him. Why don't you wrap up the show with that? Yeah, listen, Revelation chapter 12, verses 11 and 12 have become two of my favorite scriptures in the entire Bible, and I use them all the time, and I like to read them backwards, <laughs> because <laughs> Revelation twelve twelve says this, Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows his time is short. That's right. You see, even Satan understands he can't win. You say, well, what about Revelation twelve eleven? Why do you like to read them backwards? Because that lets us know we're in for the fight of our lives. Revelation twelve twelve. Satan is coming down to us, and he is coming after us like never before. But Revelation twelve eleven gives us the key. And they triumphed over him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Yeah. And they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Yes. How do we overcome? By being under the blood of Jesus and by the word of our testimony. Man, that brings Romans ten nine to just life in a whole new meaning. <laughs> that that we you know, that we must proclaim the name of Jesus, that we must not be ashamed to proclaim the name of Jesus, confess with our mouth by the word of our testimony. Right, exactly. And then and then that third element, and you don't cling to life even shrinking from death. In other words, you're willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, if necessary, to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And many hundreds of thousands of our brothers and sisters in the centuries before us have done that very thing. Many of them in the Middle East in our own lifetime and in China and North Korea and, and various Muslim nations have laid down their life proclaiming that Jesus is Lord, even though the satanic powers around them were going to destroy them and their testimony. But their testimony was not destroyed because they knew they were under the blood. That's what Revelation 12 is all about. You are, you are exactly right. There's some, some taking us back into the past, 
some advice for our day and some great advice for days that, in my opinion, are not too far ahead of us. Yeah, right. Yeah. So let me just wrap it up. Let's us wrap it up, Brandon. I, I'll speak just a second, and then I'll let you have the very last word to wrap it up uh, for this edition of Heart of America. Um, let me just wrap it up by saying this. Folks, please hear our hearts. We're not making fun of, we're not trying to disparage people who have bought on to this rapture, September 23rd rapture date based upon Revelation 12.1. What we are saying is we're putting this whole thing in biblical context. Brandon started in Genesis chapter 1, and we've gone all the way through back to Revelation 12. We've given you the context. Could the rapture happen on September 23rd? It could, because that's in the hands of the Lord. And if it does, then praise Jesus, but I don't think it's because of an alignment of constellations and planets and stars. I think it's because that's the day the Lord picked. But I have a sneaking suspicion that that's not going to be the day, because Jesus was clear. We cannot set the day and the hour. However, we are told to be aware of the season in which we're living, to see the signs around us, the prophetic signs. Look, Brandon, Israel's already back in the land. That Middle East has collapsed and collided. Russia and China are in the Middle East in a, Syri- in a Syrian nation that has fallen into civil war. Turkey is rising into an Islamic caliphate. Uh, Iran and North Korea are in cahoots with nuclear weapons. North Korea is tied to China. Iran is tied to Russia. Russia and China are tied together. I mean, we're living in unprecedented times. ISIS has arisen. Uh, the Middle Eastern nations have gone through turmoil and civil wars. Um, borders are collapsing in European Union and in the United States. These are signs that are right before our eyes that we cannot deny. We don't have to look to an alignment of constellations to try to predict a secret formula for a secret rapture in a secret passage of Scripture. Brandon, that's that's what I'm trying to get across to people. No, you, you're exactly right, and I would just encourage people, number one, keep your eyes on Jesus, stay in His Word, and, and, and ask God for discernment of His Word. Be ready at all all times to confess with your mouth that yes. Jesus Christ is Lord. Yes. Because we don't know when our time is going to be called and when our time comes. Who knows that maybe the person that we're supposed to confess in front of, we may be their opportunity. Yeah. And, and so we have to be ready. We have to be ready at all times. So I just would encourage people, don't, let's not put our faith in the sun and the moon and the stars. Let's put it in, in, in God and Jesus and in his word and his contextual word. Yeah. Well said. Well spoken, Brandon. Brandon, thanks for dropping in with us today and spending your time with us on Heart of America with Carl Gallops. This has been your host, Carl Gallops, and co-host Brandon Gallops. We'll be back uh, in future um, episodes of Heart of America. Glad you've tuned in today, and we both prayerfully hope that this has helped you to put this whole matter in context. After September 23rd, this particular edition of Heart of America will be rather irrelevant uh, in, in that it will have come and gone and passed, just like the 88 days, 88 reasons, etc. But I hope it will always be relevant for people to come back and to listen to and to understand how to properly divide the Word of God. And uh, so anyway, Brandon, thank you for your participation in it. Thank you for all of your magnificent addition to, to this program today. And listeners, thank you for tuning in to Heart of America with Carl Gallops. We'll see you next time. God bless you.